Good morning, Gaming family. I just want to thank you for tuning in today with us on the um, on the subject of angels. I pray that whatever Pastor Ezekiel explains and goes through with us, that it will come through from his heart and from the word of, of the Lord. So I just want to thank you for all your comments, for all your feedback on this message, and I pray that you have a blessed time. Good morning to you, and what a privilege it is for us to be together once again. We're going to go into a time of worship. We're just going to play a song for us. And then after we need to come back together and we are going to carry on our journey with angels this morning. And I know you will be tremendously blessed. Thank you so much. Let's just come together wherever you are, even if you're with your families. Let's just come together and sing the face of God for a few minutes. We worship and then after pray before we get into the Word of God. God bless you.
awesome and there's so much I just feel and sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place before we get into the word let's just bow our heads and just pray father we honor you for your presence we honor you for your glory we honor you for your cabode in this place we thank you that you're almighty and all-powerful and you're all glorious and there is none like you and God we thank you that you are God who is alive, you speak to your people. Oh God, you touch our lives, you minister to us, oh God. You still heal and deliver and set us free, oh God. And God, your word says you speak your word and you heal their diseases. And Lord, I pray, even as the word is spoken this morning, Lord, let it ignite a holy flame within, within our hearts, oh God. A holy passion to seek your face, oh God. We chase after you, Lord. We give you glory, Lord, even as we sit at your feet and, and listen to your voice. I pray, God, that the voice of heaven will be heard in this place. In the name of Jesus, that you will be exalted and lifted up high above everything. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is for me to be with you once again. And we are going to carry on with our journey on angels this morning. This is the second message on this series. And in particular, we are speaking on the holy angels. Last week, we understood that they remain part of our history 
throughout the scriptures God had used them and they will be continually involved in our present and future as well because their presence we see throughout Genesis going up to Revelation and I, I know that there's always the Lord's doing upon this earth, upon this earth through his angelic host. We understood that they belong to a heavenly order which is a spiritual realm and they are spirit beings and because they are spirit beings we went through scriptures to have an understanding that they, ha they are in the immediate presence of God and also that they are superior because man is made lower than the angels. So they are mightier and more intellect and more powerful than mankind. We also understood that they have, they, they, they have, there is this engagement or interaction between the angelic host and mankind and that engagement or interaction or encounters are of spiritual nature because angels are spiritual beings. And we understood that even though these interactions are in the spirit realm, the manifestation of such interactions or interruptions or engagements are manifested in the physical realm. We learned in, in Daniel chapter 10 that there was a whole territory of Persia where Daniel was seeking the answer for the kingdom and for his people, especially Jews, and how the vision was given to him and how the angels, there was a war going on between the fallen angels, Bible speaks of him as the prince of Persia, a, 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 a principality that was assigned over a region. And then we see an angel coming in who was held by this principality. And the, the archangel comes, Michael comes and there was a fight in the heavenlies whereas Daniel is on the earth waiting for his answer not realizing that his interaction in the spirit realm through prayer has caused literally a fight literally a battle literally a conflict between the fallen angels the principalities and the holy angels which God had assigned and it happened through prayer it happened through prayer that this interaction this war breaks in right in the territory of Persia where Daniel was an angel brings an answer to him we understand that the spirit of man is always you know exposed to such realities because the spirit of man is connected if he's righteous and if you're saved your spirit man is craving for that kind of supernatural attention and god had given to us the angelic host we also learned that they are created not to rule but to serve we learned that they are ministering spirits given to us the believers not for us to rule over them, we understood that we cannot command them because they are higher in the spiritual ranking to us and we cannot command them. They are subjected to Christ, we learned, and because they are subjected to Christ, only Christ can command them and He, through our prayers to Him, can assign angels to rescue us, to deliver us. And that's where we find that they are subjected to Christ and they must worship him as well according to the word of God in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6. Now today we are going to go a little bit more further and that's where we find ourselves coming into the vision of Isaiah chapter 6. And in the scripture Bible speaks of Isaiah having this marvelous vision of the heavenlies of God's throne. Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 in the year that King Isaiah died I then saw the Lord sitting on a throne and this is the throne of the most high high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Bible says above it stood above what? Above the throne there was a hovering Above it stood the seraphs, these are the angels, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3 says, 
And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the doorpost moved or shook at the voice of one who cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Bible says in verse 5. Then I said, woe to me, woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Bible says in verse 6, Then one of the serfs flew to me, having a live burning coal in his hand. So they have six wings and they got human hands. Bible says he had a coal, a burning coal in his hand, snatched with tongues from the altar. Verse, verse 7 says, And he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Hallelujah. Then we find after this powerful encounter that Isaiah has with this seraph, there is a commissioning of Isaiah. Bible says in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we look at the scripture. Scripture starts with the death of King Uzziah who ruled over Israel for 52 years. And the Bible speaks of him dying of leprosy somewhere around in, nine, in, in 739 BC. Now he was a great king and after his death you find that Uzziah was grieved in his spirit and he was seeking the answers and that's where he's found in the temple and he had this heavenly vision. First five chapters we find that he has received prophecies and those prophecies were of rebuke often and thereafter we find that in verse in chapter 6 when he reaches chapter 6 he returns to authenticate what he had already written by describing how God had called him. And God called him through a heavenly vision. I remember my growing up as well, I must have been 12, where I had a powerful encounter with a heavenly vision. And my life was never the same. I understood then that that was the call of God. God, God literally pulling me out. Even though I had started ministering way before that and I was baptized, but in that particular month I remember there was this godly encounter in my vision that I had and I had this, this vision of angels and I was, I was never the same. I remember walking in and having these teenagers following me and as I turned and asked them, why are you following me? Are you okay? And they says, tell us about God. And I said, why would you ask me about it? And they says, because it's written all over you that you carry something that we need. And I can never forget that incident. As I started to open my mouth, I see them crying and repenting before God. So I've seen how the visions can transform you. And this was the vision that Isaiah had. And this was the vision of God's very own throne where God was seated on his throne. When we look at the concept of God's throne, we see he's highly exalted and he's lifted up. And the Bible says his train filled the temple. Before we get into the train, I just want to emphasize something on the throne. You see, the, the current prevailing world system that we are so accustomed to is democracy and we have the capitalism. And we, we have both of these systems that are running and you have communists as well and dictatorship in some of the countries. But all these governance throughout the world, wherever they are led, they are led on the core value of self 
centeredness and majority of our candidates who stands for for the uh, for the elections or for the seating of governments they also are very self-conscious of their own the own interest of power and governance and those who vote they vote in accordance to to the protection of their own rights to the protection of their own belief system and privileges and interest you will never vote a party if the interest or the belief system or the structure doesn't align with your conscience and that's where we find that we align ourselves with like-mindedness so the whole structure the political structure or the government structure in the world thrives on one core value and that is self-centered value self-centered value for the politicians because they are in power and they want to rule and that's why they stand for the office and self-centered for centeredness for the voters because they want their values their belief system their privileges their interests to be promoted and brought into the governance as well so there is one one value core value that is self-centered value throughout the world in any government in any earthly government and it promotes it promotes independency and it promotes self-sufficiency when we look at the monopoly on the kingdom concept on the other hand it is totally contrast to the world government why because in the in the kingdom or in the mono, in the monarchy we find that the you don't have to vote for king to be elected and you you cannot appoint him and you cannot take him out the the kingdom concept or the kingship is a autocratic and it's not gained by democratic votes and that's where we find the the concept of god's rule throughout the scripture is a kingdom concept why because no one can decide for him a king don't need a big council to help him make decisions he can wake up and he don't need a parliamentary approval to pass legislations because he is king he can decide as he pleases no one can appoint him as a king and no one can take away his kingship it's in him and he will remain king as long as he's alive no one can dictate what happens in the kingdom as well because he remains in control of everything a king cannot be voted in or out and assume power regardless of personal popularity he cannot be impeached or replaced unless there is a rebellion or revolt this explains why all the scriptures the concept of the kingship is upon God himself that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and when he relates his governments governance over the earth he relates it as not as a president or a prime minister or a dictator but as a king and everything that is in his kingdom is subjected to him he does not need anybody's approval and he does not need uh, to please anybody he, he will do as he pleases and often his ways are higher than our, our ways and we will go through that just now his rule is absolute and to complete to the point that he cannot be moved or shaken by any opposition that's how powerful God's rule is upon the earth as a king he's simply and clearly God and he rules the universe as a creator and king he's fully in charge and control of his domain called the kingship called the kingdom which we you and I are part of it when we become his family we submit to him as subjects we are the servant sons to this almighty God hallelujah I was raised and born I was born and raised in Pakistan and it was part of the old ancient kingdom of Persia and I remember wherever we went to see this beautiful ancient sites of palaces the God will take us into the inner chambers of the king and it will be so beautiful because the decorations 
of in the inner chambers of the king will be personal to his liking. So when you enter a throne room or in a chamber of a palace in the ancient kingdoms, you find that it speaks volumes about the character and the nature of the king. Because every decor in the throne room is according to his liking. The colors, the tiles, how the, the layout of the tables and the furniture, it speaks of absolute character and liking of the king. A throne room can reveal to you the innermost characteristics of a king. And it amazes me that the, the word of God is no different. When we get into the shutting of the throne room, God it's like God just gave us the glimpse of what he is really like because the throne room is filled with so much mysteries of who God is and what he is like and what his glory, his cabal is like because every detail in the throne room uh, speaks of his majesty, it speaks of his splendor, it speaks of his glory and character and nature and that's why this study for me is very close to my heart. I believe every preacher has a message and my message is the message of the throne room because it speaks of the essence and everything that God is and it excites me every single time. Now we look at in the kingdom the, the center of the kingdom or the center of everything the pivotal center of the kingdom is the throne of the king. Hallelujah. So the throne, when you look at the throne, it becomes the pivotal center of everything because it dictates the very future of the kingdom, of decisions, ceremonies, bestowings of gifts, commissioning, planning, judgment is done in the throne room. So the throne becomes whenever a king has to commission or make decisions or pass a judgment, he has to sit on the throne because his throne represents his kingship. His throne represents his authority, a place of authority, and that exactly how God's throne is. When Isaiah saw the throne of God, he saw a place that is highly exalted and lifted up, and it's a heavenly realm according to the word of God in Matthew chapter 5 verse 34. It is an exalted place as we read in Isaiah 6 verse 1. It is a place of power, authority, and accountability according to the word of God in Job chapter 1 verse 6. It's a place of majesty and honor according to the word of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. It's a place of justice according to the word of God in Psalm chapter 9 verse 7. Hallelujah. Bible says he prepared, he has prepared his throne for judgment. And then also in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. So it's a place of justice. It's a place of sovereignty and holiness according to the word of God in Psalm chapter 7 verse Seven verse eight, Bible says God reigns over the nation, and God is seated on His holy throne. And then Psalm 103 verse 19 says, "The Lord has prepared His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all the earth." So the throne room of God speaks of His holiness because it's a holy throne. The throne room of God speaks of God's serenity because He rules over all the earth. As he sits on the throne is a place of highest honor and worship as well. As we read in Isaiah how they are exalting God because the throne room of God is intensified with the highest form of worship that man can, mankind has ever seen. So in essence we find also the place of purity. The throne room of God is the place of purity, the place of eternal life. According to Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 and place of purity according to Revelation chapter 14 verse 5. My God, hallelujah. It's a place of grace because that's where he sits and extends his grace according to the word of God in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. So the throne room of God is a place of grace and it's a place of absolute surrender to his majesty, the throne room of God. And that's where we find in, Revel in, in Philippians, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. To 11 and they are in Revelation chapter 4 from verse 10 to 11. So in summary, 
The throne of God is the highest place of authority, honor, and rule. It reflects his holy character, his majesty, his splendor, his authority, his supremacy. It is where the highest and pure form of worship Praise and adoration is found not only by angels but men and women from every tribe, every nation, every tongue that cannot be numbered. It is also a place where the highest form of God's glory is revealed to mankind with judgment and grace and mercy and love and eternal life, purity and holiness are found in a place of absolute surrender and transcendent authority and that is the throne for us the throne room of the throne room of god and the throne of god so when Isaiah saw the throne Isaiah saw god in his fullness the revelation of god in his fullness is found when he's seated on the throne because it's a place of absolute authority and it's a place of absolute glory and splendor and majesty of the one who has created everything now when we look at the the angels who are in the throne room we we understood last week that they are they are countless according to the word of God in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22. The angels are countless in the throne. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 verse 11 as well he says, And I beheld, Revelation chapter 5 verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. So they are in the throne room of God and they are circling around the throne and the beasts and the elders these are the living creatures and the elders with 24 elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and 10,000 of 10,000 you actually cannot put a number to it in other words the number is infinite it's countless so the Bible says, I saw the angels circling around the throne and they are thousands upon thousands times thousands and thousands. In other words, they are in number. You cannot count them. They're countless. In that region, John had the, the, the number were given of 10,000 and thousands and thousands and they are in billions. You must understand that such a big number in the throne room that cannot be counted. And each one of these angels are not small in stature. They are mighty. Imagine an angel watching over a city. How big he must be. Because you must know and understand that angel is not, angels are not all knowing and they're not all powerful. But how much power and how much stature he must have to watch over a domain, a city, like we see in the book of Daniel, chapter 10. This, 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 this angel, the fallen angel, was a principality, was called the prince of Persia. Now, how big the angel must be that he can cover the whole city and watch over a city. So they, they are not small in stature, they can be huge and mighty. But imagine this now, these mighty and huge angels, righteous angels, are in God's throne and the Bible says they cannot be numbered. Then we find in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, after this I beheld, Lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindred and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. No, but now in this scripture Bible says that in Revelation 7, 9 it says that they are people, multitude that no one could number. They are countless. It means there are billions of them that nobody can even number them. And where are they? They are standing before the throne. My God. They are standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm leaves in their hands. 
So imagine now throne room filled with countless angels that you cannot number them, who are mighty in stature. So imagine the space they are taking. And then you look at this scripture and you look at the multitude that John is describing that nobody can number. How could, how could all these creatures, humans that cannot be numbered in multitude, and angels who are great and mighty in stature, stature and cannot be numbered, are found in one room, and that is the throne room of God. How big that throne room must be. Just imagine that. How big that throne room must be that it can accommodate the multitudes of mankind that cannot be numbered, who are redeemed and now before the throne room of God, before the throne of God, and then there are angels that surround the throne that cannot be numbered, and there are millions and billions of them. How big the throne room must be. Just thought how big the throne room must be. And then Bible speaks of it. Even another shocking fact that God walks into that throne room. And Bible says the train, the train of his robe filled the temple. Just imagine this such a big throne room to accommodate the literary gods all creation and then God walks into that throne room and just the hem of his garment just the fringe of his glorious robe just his train fills the temple how big God must be that his robe just the train of his robe just the hedge of his garment can fill such a mighty and glorious throne room, how big that God must be. And that's why when Isaiah describes him in, in, in 66, chapter 1, chapter 66, verse 1, he says, So Jehovah says, Heaven is my throne, and earth my footstool. Where then in the house that you build for me, and where is the place of my rest? God is so big. My God, that even the mightiest of the mighty angels look puny because just his robe can fill the accommodation for the whole universe. And that's why the Bible says he sits on the throne and his earth is his footstool. That's how big this God is. And we often wonder with our reasoning, this God that we can't even comprehend in our thoughts, in our minds, such a big God. And with our puny, tiny, Pity reasonings, we question and reason this mighty God. Bible says in Isaiah 55 verse 8, Bible says, When my thoughts are not your thoughts, now you nor your ways are my ways, says Jehovah verse 9 says, As for the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God said, I'm so glorious and magnificent and mighty and higher. How do you even dare to compare your thoughts with mine? How do you dare even to reason with what I'm doing? This is the great God. Yet he desired to have a fellowship with you. Yet he desired to come and dwell in you. Yet he desired to redeem you. Yet he desired to set you free. God whose strength can fill the temple. The temple that can take the whole universe in. That be God. Amazingly, we find these two crowds that are unnumbered. Countless humans who are men, men and women of, of, of the ra- uh, righteous who are the dean of God, whose name is found in the book of life. They are there before the throne room of God, before this throne, and they find the angels as well and found in the same place. So it's the presence of God that unites the angelic host and the humans. It brings them to one place. 
It's the presence of God. And even up until now, when you start to experience and you dive into the presence of God and you dream from His presence, it attracts the angelic host. Why? Because the presence of God was a common factor that they were there in one place. Because the angels behold God's glory. They behold God's glory. And you find that the mankind in worship when He is, he is in the throne room, he behold God's glory and they come together and that's the place both of them are found the fellowship of the angelic host and the righteous of God is found in the presence of God and that's the reason they visit church yes you heard me right they visit church you know why because the, the, as the glory, the presence of God brings the humans and the angels together and the worship because the saints were crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. So the, the worship, the worship, the unceasing worship was carried out and even the, the, the mankind and all the redeemed of God were worshipping together. So firstly the presence of God brings them together and then they are together worshipping God in the throne room. Secondly, the worship brings them together. So you are a worshipper. If you are a worshipper, you attract the angels. Why? Because they will join with you in harmonies in exalting God and often Satan will hinder your worship Satan will hinder your praise why because it has the capacity to draw these celestial beings into your very life into your rooms because the worship of Yahweh Jehovah God attracts them why because they were created to worship Hallelujah. And you were created to worship. They were created for God's glory. And you were created for God's glory. And when you be all God's glory in your life, you attract them because they live to see God manifest. They are found in the church for the same reason. And my text comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. Now, this is where Paul is laying down some rules for the church gathering. And he's speaking of the man, man's role and woman's role and how woman must cover her head. When he reaches verse 10 in chapter 11 of the first Corinthians, he says, For this reason, the woman ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. Why would he mention because of the angels while dealing with a, a church problem in the context of the church rules and regulations? How men should come and how women should come. And then he says because of the angels. Why? Because Paul had a revelation that whenever you guys come to the church, the angels are in present in this place. Hallelujah. They are in the church. Why? Because when you start to exalt God and worship God, you literally joining in the choirs of heaven. When you start to glorify God and lift up your hands, you are joining in. So the angels are found in the church according to the word of God. And Paul says, for the sake of angels that are around you, do this, 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 because they are present when you come together to worship. So that's how powerful your worship is, because your worship literally lifts you up from the earthly realm and places you before God's throne, where you are joined with the redeemed of God who are gone before you in worshiping the Lord of heavens. When you join in the angels, the countless number of angels, the, the host of angels, the armies of God, the warriors of God together. So your worship places you in that vantage, in a place where you are literally taken into the reality of who God is. Because it attracts 
the angels. It takes you. It literally takes you before the throne room of God. And that's why your, your, your worship often when you are worshiping and you are worshiping with your, all your heart, you find all your worries are lifted up. People get emotional and start to cry because all the baggages that they carry is suddenly lifted out. Why? Because in the atmosphere that charged with worship and is connected with the heavenlies, all the earthly things just fall away. And that's why people feel lighter. People get healed. People get delivered during worship. Why? Because they are ministering spirits within uh, around us during the worship as well that are just seeing us and helping us out. I was just sharing with Minister Shonen that the spirit of God is given to us to work in us and through us. Hallelujah. But the angelic calls are assigned to us for things that we cannot do ourselves. So you have the spirit of God working in you and through you. But what you can't do, the angelic hosts are assigned to do for you. That what, that's why they are ministering spirits sent to us, the children of God. So your worship becomes very important and significant in the sight of God. Why? Because, because it connects you to the spirit realm. It opens doors for you to have communion with angels. It attracts the angelic hosts. Bible says in the book of John chapter 4 verse 23 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh us to worship him. So the Spirit of God is not searching for religious people. The Spirit of God is not searching for spiritual people, the people that are busy and doing things and serving whatsoever. Spirit of God is searching the Father, is searching people who can worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what the, the Spirit of God is searching. That's what the Father is searching. Because if you worship in spirit, you are connected with the spirit realm, which is the realm and the domain of God. Because the heaven is his throne and you are before him. You are connected in truth of who God is, the reality of who God is. So the worship in spirit and in truth, that is the demand, demand placed upon your life and upon my life. Because it literally connects us with who God is. It connects us everything that he stands for. His character, his nature, and everything. So, so it is a privilege for us to worship him. It's a privilege for you to worship him. And those of you whose worship is diminishing, I pray that God will restore your worship. I pray that in the midst of a storm, that you will raise your hallelujahs. Because that worship coming out of you in spirit and in truth will cause will cause the heavenlies to shift, will cause the angelic host to come down to your aid because the worship attracts them and then they come in and they worship with you. They join in with you. Wherever the presence of God is, they want to be there because they are around the throne from eternity to eternity. They don't leave God's sight. is the sight that they want to behold. And if you can accommodate, my God, if you can make room for God's presence in your life, you will see the hosts of angels just coming down on you, visiting your families in your houses. There is going to be a visitation. I declare all your life that there is going to be angelic visitations in your house. As you listen to this word and as you ignite that flame of worship in your heart and ignite that flame of sensitivity to God's presence, I declare that you are going to experience God in that manner, that you are going to experience God's presence and power like never before. You will have this encounter in the name of Jesus Christ. Worshiping truth and spirit literally translates into the direct presence of God and we become part of the choirs of heavens before the throne. You worship 
When we come together to worship, we become part of God's choir. And here we are just joining in every time. Every time in spirit and in truth when you lift up your hand. Truth speaks no pretense. Truth is, it means no pretense. It's not a, a show. It's not a performance. It's not a pretense. It's truth. Truth in essence that whatever I'm offering you, God, is from my heart to you. And there is no gimmick. That kind of truth in our worship. But literally get, gets us into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Bible says that they were crying to one another. Holy, holy, holy. There's a three reputations of God's holiness. And in theology we call it the trihagion. Trihagion is, is the reputation. Whenever there is a three reputation throughout the scriptures, it means God is emphasizing the point. There is an emphasis. There is a concentration. And that's why when Jesus speaks of it as well in the Gospels, verily, verily, I say unto you, there is, there is that emphasis on something that is of importance. Also, when the angels start to cast out the judgment in the book of Revelation, we find the angels declaring, try hanging on, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that was the highest level of sorrow released to mankind. So when we look at three times of reputation of God's holiness, we believe, I believe that is the highest form of God's holiness being manifested and released because it's the highest, highest, the emphasis is there's no greater level. He's holy and holy and holy and there's no one holier than him. That's why the emphasis is on three times. Bible speaks of it, and I want to close with this. We haven't reached the seraphims as well. And I was so excited, but our time is running out. I want to speak of their wings. I want to speak of the, the meaning, who they are, and why they are above the throne. But this is where I want to finish us with today. I don't want to prolong this. Bible says, the whole earth, they crying out God's holiness, and then they says, the whole earth is filled with God's glory. Bible, when Bible speaks of them, Bible speaks of them above the throne. Bible says that above the throne were seraphs. So their vision, their view is through the lens of God's glory. Everything filters through whatever they see through that glory that they see from the throne and then from the throne to the earth. So everything that they see, they see in that light and that's why when they see the earth they see the earth covered with God's glory it's, it's, it's sad that we are blinded to see that glory we are blinded to see God's glory upon this earth and the reason for that is we have refused to glorify him we have refused to accept him as God our eyes are blinded to see God's glory our eyes are blinded with sin our eyes are blinded with idolatry and adultery and fornication and ungodliness and, and covetousness and jealousy and all kind of wild sins that have blinded us to see God's glory God's glory in creation God's glory in our marriages, God's glory in our houses, God's glory in our communities, in our, in our country. The sin has blinded us to see. The sin remains that blindfold upon our eyes. And that's why the Bible speaks of it in Romans. The Bible says in the, in the epistle of Romans chapter 1 verse 23. That man and the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 23 and change and the change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things it's like they we have replaced God with our own idols and because we have replaced God with something else we don't tend to see his presence we don't tend to see his glory what the seraphs are seeing but also the same epistle chapter 1 verse 20 says 
For the unseen things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Unseen things. Look at this. He says the unseen things are clearly seen. Being realized by the things that are made. They are unseen things are clearly seen and being made realized by the things that are made. What is made? The creation and his eternal power and God Godhead for them to be without excuse. So Paul says man is without excuse because man can see the reality of unseen things into things that are seen and are made. Hallelujah. So he says that the, the beauty of the unseen can be seen into the things that are made. Creation is made. You and I are made. And we can see the beauty of the unseen realities in our lives through the things that are made. But we are blind to it. Why? Because the sin has covered us. And it's like, you know, you have a ticket to this beautiful concert and this magnificent theater and you just blindfold yourself and you get into this theater and you sit and watch and you miss the point of the whole display of, of the splendor of the play. Why? Because you are blindfolded. So we sit in there and we are blinded. We cannot experience, we cannot feel, we can't, we can't have the vision of what's happening because of this blindfold. But the search, when they when they sit, they see with naked eyes everything that God has created is covered with God's goodness and with God's glory. Beloved, I would encourage you today that even God has joined you with these angels together in worship and in His presence. I would encourage you Take the blindfold off and let your worship be like the worship of seraphs. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the whole earth, your family, your, your workplaces, your businesses, your community is filled with God's glory. Let's change our language. Let our voices be tuned in line with the word of God. In line with the visions, visions of heavenlies. Because when angels see the earth, they see God's glory filling the earth. Hallelujah. What a privilege it is for us to be the beholder of that glory. To be the beholder of that worship. That can literally lift up our burdens and take us into the presence of God in the midst of these beautiful creatures. Hallelujah. As a child of God, you have that kind of privilege. And very few, my God, very few have that privilege, but you've given that privilege to worship God in His holiness, in His splendor, and, and connect yourself with the choirs of heavens. Join yourself with the choirs of heavens. What is stopping you? What is hindering your worship? What is hindering you to, to, to be sensitive to the presence of God? Take it off and chuck it out because you're hindering the angelic presence in your life. They are waiting to help. They are waiting to deliver you. They are waiting to assist you because they are sent to help. But they can join with you in worship. They can join with you in the presence of God when they see that you are one of those who are sensitive to the presence of God. They want to come and have fellowship with you. Because that's what they do in the throne room. They are joining these celestial beings Numberless, they're countless, they're joining with the creation in worshipping God. On the same floor, my God, is mixed up all, everybody. What a marvelous sight. And not only for the future, even for now. I pray that the angelic choirs will visit your houses when they see you singing. I pray that you will be taken to the visions of heavens when you start to worship. 
when you start to be sensitive and, and make room for God's presence in your life. Let it happen to you. I declare a prayer with you that it will happen to you in the name of Jesus. That you will have encounters with the heavenly beasts. I bless you in the name of Jesus. We just touched on the first two verses of Isaiah 6 today. We're going to go through the, the, the trembling and shaking that took place. We're going to go through the seraphs that are the hovering over. <laughs> Over the throne room, over the throne of God, worshiping Him. We're going to go into the depth of understanding of their wings and the call that they had. There's so much more into it. We're just getting started with. Hallelujah. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Come on, just close your eyes. Let me just release these blessings over your life. There's such a tremendous anointing in this place. Father, we just pray your healing upon your people. Bible says you're, <laughs> there's healing in your wings. My God. Wrap your people around with those wings. The angelic wings, like the healing come. My God. Father, I pray provision in the name of Jesus. Like the angels brought food for Jesus in Matthew 4 after his temptation. Oh God, I pray provision will come to the hungry. Oh, I give you glory, honor, Lord. I thank you that you're a deliverer. Like your angel delivered the Israelites of God, the angel of the Lord parted the sea, delivered them from the enemies of God. I pray you will deliver your people. Lord, I thank you. You will lead them like the angel led the Israelite to the pillar and the cloud. Pillar of fire and the cloud of God, I pray you will lead your people. There's going to be a, a manifestation of the heavenly host in the name of Jesus. Even as we align our worship of God with the choirs of angels of God. Even as we align our lives with the Lord, with your presence of God, where we are sensitive in keeping your presence, God, I pray our lives will never be the same. In the name of Jesus, I release these blessings. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for once again for joining us. We are praying for you, we're thinking of you, we love you, we miss all of you. I hope and pray that soon this pandemic will be over, that we can get together and be in the house of God and worship Him, where we can lift up His name together and have even angels coming in visiting us. And I pray that the Lord will sustain you during this time. We are, we are praying for you, myself and Mr. Shane. And the leadership, we want to thank you, those who contribute through your giving. Your generosity is before God. Thank you so much. You not only sustain us you, the, who are serving with you as your pastoral couple, pastoral family, but you sustain many of those who are in need. This week we handed down quite a few hampered, grocery hampers. Families were blessed. And I feel privileged in how little we have during this time in the church. There is that spurt of unison where we are giving. And I, I want to appreciate you and we, we, we thank you for your generosity in, in your giving, in your donations, in your tithes and offerings as well. And for the grocery hampers. Remain safe, stay safe, remain blessed. And I will see you on Wednesday. God bless you. Have a fantastic summer ahead. We love you.